Well, we are waiting for some key decisions from the Supreme Court this week. The high court already, though, adding a controversial case to its docket for later this year. That could throw a wrench into Democrats' plans to tax the wealthy. Rick Newman is here. Rick, this has got a lot of people talking already. Yeah, it's arcane. I'll try to stay out of the weeds, but it is interesting. So part of the uh, 2017 tax cut, which uh, Republicans passed without any Democrats uh, on board, uh, included a repatriation tax, which didn't affect a lot of people, but um, basically it said that any Americans who own an, a certain stake above a threshold in any foreign companies, that they had to pay tax to the U.S. government on, on that stake as if it were a capital gain. In other words, as if they actually sold their shares in that company, even if they didn't sell the shares. So it would be like if you owned Apple stock here in the United States, you would get taxed on the value of that Apple stock instead of getting taxed on the gain in the stock once you sold it. So there was a couple in Washington state that uh, had to pay almost $15,000 in tax. They protested, uh, they lost uh, on appeal, they lost on a second appeal, and now it's at the Supreme Court. And the reason this matters is this is basically the same principle as a wealth tax that um, Elizabeth Warren was one of her big uh, uh, proposals when she ran for president in 2020, a wealth tax, um, you know, so you tax people on their wealth, not on their income, which means on the amount of stuff they hold, not in the amount of stuff they sell. So um, if the Supreme Court would say, yeah, this is possible, then it opens the door to a wealth tax. And on the other hand, if the Supreme Court says, no, this is not valid, uh, two things, it's going to it's going to basically say there is no basis for a wealth tax. And number two, um, the government's going to have to give back some tax money it collected, and overall it expected to get about $400 billion over 10 years or something like $40 billion a year. So it matters, but as you pointed out, we're not gonna get to this until later this year. And meanwhile, we're probably gonna have some momentous decisions coming later this week. All right, Rick, let's turn to an another story that I know you're closely watching, which has real implications for today and really going forward. And that's the latest developments out of Russia following the revolt inside the country over the weekend. Vladimir Putin just holding a, a, telev a televised address moments ago, talking about the fact that they did take all measures to neutralize the danger. He did go on to say that the Wagner troops can join Russia army or go to Belarus. I'm curious just to get your perspective on the events that played out over the weekend and what happens now for Russia and Putin? Uh, yeah, the criminology has not been, been this interesting since the 1991 revolution. This is fascinating. So um, the small question is what happens to the Wagner mercenary group. And, and now it sounds like Putin has shifted a little bit from saying this thing is going to be completely disbanded and absorbed by the Russian military to now saying uh, they can they can have some sort of sanctuary sanctuary in Belarus which neighbors Russia to its west and is just north of Ukraine, um, which is kind of quite a different thing. So that that is an interesting development that suggests a kind of maybe a second lease on life for uh, you have Jenny Prigozhin, the guy who leads the Wagner Group. But the much bigger question is what kind of fissures are uh, are there in Putin's control of Russia? Uh, and and that you just asked a question nobody knows the answer to. What's going to happen next? I guess it's possible that this all settles down. Uh, what by, might be more likely are reprisals throughout the government, perhaps an effort to go after Prigozhin. Maybe he'll fall out of a window, as some P Putin critics do, or maybe he'll end up in the hospital with signs of poisoning. Who knows? Um, but most analysts I'm following say this is not over. There's going to be a lot more to come. Rick, the same question I asked Michael O'Hanlon from Brookings earlier. How does this shift the strategy for the U.S.? as well as NATO allies, could we see them intensify pressure on Vladimir Putin, potentially adding additional sanctions? Right. You, you might think, well, uh, this is the most vulnerable Putin has seemed in the 23 years he's been in control. So maybe this is a tipping point, and maybe it's a good time to sort of pile on, which the United States could do with more sanctions. Uh, they could lower the price cap on oil to try to squeeze Russia's oil revenue more. They could certainly give more advanced weapons to Ukraine. But I, but I don't think we're going to see that, at least not anytime soon, because, I mean, I keep hearing people uh, repeat the old Napoleonic phrase, uh, don't interrupt when, you're, when your enemy is making a mistake. And you don't want to give Putin any reason to say, see, it's, it's what I've been saying all along. The whole West is ganging up on us. NATO is ganging up on us. This is an existential battle for Russia's, Russia's survival. You want to make it look as if you're staying completely out of it 
you know, just business as usual with regard to support for Ukraine. Maybe that will change uh, as time goes, as a little bit of time passes here. So it doesn't look like the United States and Europe have any role at all in whatever challenges Putin faces at uh, home. That's critical. But um, this sure does seem like it could potentially be the best opportunity for some kind of breakthrough by Ukraine in the whole time this war has been going on. What is it, uh, uh, 16, 17 months at this point? Yeah, certainly could be additional developments coming here. Rick Newman, as always, thanks so much for that. Bye, guys.